Welcome uh, everybody and this sort of slightly cold and miserable Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Mark Critch, I'm Chief Executive of my society uh, and uh, I've got great pleasure in introducing uh, the new policy uh, paper produced by my colleagues uh, Rebecca Rumble and Alex Parsons uh, looking at how we can reform freedom of, freedom of information in the UK and to suggest a number of improvements to strengthen access to information in the UK. And over the next 30 minutes or so, also joined uh, by two great speakers, uh, Jim Killock from the Open Rights Group, uh, who is, you know, over many years has taken such great interest in access to information, privacy rights and so on, and has uh, got some really kind of important uh, you know, contributions to the discussion. And also uh, Peter Gagan from Open Democracy. Uh, Open Democracy have been real champions of freedom of information uh, over the past few years. And uh, as I'm sure Peter will uh, elaborate on, are right in the middle of uh, a beginning of a court case, really, to sort of uh, bring the Cabinet Office to, to bear on, on uh, you know, greater access and the, 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 the provision of the Cleaving House, which has caused quite a lot of uh, kerfuffle, shall we say, around uh, how, how journalists and others and campaigners are treated in regards to the Freedom of Information Act. So my society, as you might know, uh, has been around for the past 18 years or so. I've been chief executive for the past six years, and we really help people be active citizens. We help people understand their rights and, and, and actually make use of those rights. Uh, and our services uh, are used in the UK and over 40 countries around the world, and we work with campaigners and individual citizens, journalists, civil society, uh, to really make use of the technology resources we have, but also the wonderful research and data that, we, that the team produces as well. Everything we do is open source and available for reuse, and we encourage you to, if you haven't already seen the report, to visit research.mysociety.org where you can see all of the great reports and policy papers that we've put together over the past few years. What we're going to talk about today is obviously freedom of information and the reason we're so interested in freedom of information, uh, not least because we run whatdotheyknow.com, which is uh, many of you I'm sure are aware is a wonderful repository of over 700,000 requests made to over 38,000 public bodies uh, over the past 13 years. And it's really testament to the variety and uh, of, of information that people want to understand from government and public sector bodies and the depth of, of uh, your information and data and, and your real answers to real questions that people have exist there. And this is, this is a core part of why the Freedom of Information Act is so important. And I guess the, the, the question for me is why are we putting this report out now? Why is it important to draw attention to how we might improve freedom of information? And I, th I think two things really. One is it's really to make the statement that freedom of information is unequivocally a good thing. I, th I think we don't say this often enough. There's a lot of you know, many, many different opinions on, on FOI and how it's used, but the, the, the access to information and the rights it grants to ordinary citizens is really, really critical. And it's especially critical because when those rights are abused, it can lead to cronyism and uh, you know, slipping standards in public life, and especially at those times when there's a, a closing of civic space, it's especially important to both celebrate the rights as they exist, but look at ways they can be reformed and extended and expanded upon. And the, the report that Beck and Alex are going to introduce really goes into some, as, as with all my society research, some really practical and actionable advice for uh, actions that can be taken really today that would improve the act and improve people's access to it. Um, so over the next half hour, um, Beck and Alex will take 10 minutes or so. They're gonna talk about the report itself. Hopefully you've all had a chance to look at it. It is uh, available online, uh, as I said, at researchmysociety.org. Uh, then Jim Killock uh, will go first. I believe Jim's uh, in, in the room already. And then Peter Gagan uh, will go next. And uh, again, if you have questions, please do put them in the chat. And we'll make sure if they can't get answered on this call, we'll make sure they're followed up afterwards as well. So really excited over the next 25 minutes. I'm going to hand over to Beck, who can take it from there and present the report. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mark. Um, just gonna... Right, um, so as Mark said, um, there is there is quite a lot going on, I think, at the moment uh, with FOI um, in the UK, but there has been, I think, a concern over the last few years that FOI maybe isn't being nurtured uh, to the extent it should be. Um, we think there are some, some really pressing issues um, these are not exhaustive. We know there are many other areas that, that need attention, but these are the ones that we felt were, were really relevant right now um, and that can have some practical impact. So, you know, we know there's millions of FOI requests being made every year, um, but as a, as a digital and as a data organization, um, you know, we think that there should be data on those requests. It's utterly absurd, in my opinion, that you can't actually say with any authority, this is how many FOI requests were made last year. Um, it, it's impossible to tell something so basic um, for such a basic right. Um, so we really believe that there is a huge data gap um, in terms of understanding how FOI is actually operating. Um, what statistics there are do actually show increasing delays, which is bad. <laughs> you know, this is not this is not something that should be allowed to slip just because people aren't really monitoring it. Um, and obviously there, you know, there was a review a few years ago, FOI survived, um, but it didn't get nurtured anymore. You know, the, the recommendations on enhancing or improving the regime uh, have not been implemented. The other thing we're really concerned about is that FOI is an increasingly marginalized proportion of the ICO's work. You know, the regulator, understandably, because it is responsible for data protection as well, um, is increasingly pivoting to, to focus on data protection at a kind of global level. Um, and we feel that FOI is very much the kind of poor brother in that relationship. Um, and the other thing as well, over the last year, I think everyone has become a little bit more aware of the devolved nature of the UK. Um, and how just how different and how much opportunity there is uh, for policy to diverge in the devolved nations. And we feel that that's something that hasn't really been looked at or considered very much um, and that maybe we should actually be looking at now. Um, so we have some broad recommendations as part of this report. Um, obviously, all there's loads and loads of detail um, in the actual report itself, which you have access to, uh, but roughly, um, we think establishing an ongoing data collection and publication program on how FOI works in the UK is absolutely crucial. Um, how can we possibly know if this law is working well and it's doing what it's supposed to do if we have no data on it? Um, we believe that for FOI to thrive and have a proper champion, um, that it should actually be carved out of the Information Commissioner's Office and established as an independent FOI or access to information commissioner, and that that person should be responsible to parliament um, rather than as part of a ministerial portfolio, because we believe FOI is a crucial constitutional issue. Um, we think that we need to improve and expand the operation and coverage of FOI. And we also want to champion innovation and divergence in the devolved nations. Um, so I'll pass over to Alex. Sorry, I've lost my mute, unmute button. So our first recommendation is, again, this problem of data collection. So at the UK in the moment, there are two sources of information about FOI statistics, well, two official sources. There have been periodic surveys done, but sort of ongoing statistics, there are only two current levels. So the Cabinet Office collects information for central government. They collect about 76 different statistics, sort of saying about if different exemptions are used, how many requests were received, how many were sent by the uh, statutory deadline. The Office of the Scottish Information Commissioner collects data across the public sector in Scotland. And so that covers it from about 500 authorities and it covers many more statistics in part because they separate FOI and environmental information requests as separate statistics, which is very useful. The trouble is, so while that's quite good in Scotland, given an overview of most of the requests going on there, in terms of FOI requests in the UK as a whole, very few of them are covered by all of this. So there are thousands and thousands and thousands more authorities subject to FOI 
and the majority of FOI sent in the UK go to these. This is especially true of local authorities where we know lots of uh, information requests go to local authorities, but despite there are periodic snapshots people do, but essentially by FOI in the authorities themselves, but there is no ongoing publication and especially no ongoing monitoring of compliance on a systematic level. The um, review in 2015 recommended that uh, there should be more data collection uh, and it sort of recommended that they should be published and they should be brought together by a central body. In the end, the code of practice change made it so that it suggested that it'd be good for authorities to publish more data, but this they, they recommend the code of practice doesn't track legal obligations such as meet the statutory deadlines. And so if lots of authorities did publish this data, it wouldn't be quite enough. At the same time as without a central collection, even publishing this data would still not get the benefits of releasing it. So a little bit of extra work to collect information into a central collection unlocks most of the value of producing the information in the first place. So based on this, we sort of think that the uh, mirror in the 2015 recommendations that the ICO or the UK regulator should hold a central repository of data about FY requests in the UK. We discussed a bit more in the report about thresholds for inclusion. Uh, but we think that limiting to bodies of a reasonable size would make, make, make the problem manageable at the same time as unlocking most of the benefit of it. But this raises a broader question of funding and the resourcing of the regulator. Over to you, Beck. So this idea about separating the information uh, and data protection regime of the ICO and creating a dedicated independent FOI champion we think is quite interesting. There is no necessity for the two roles to, to be combined. It's quite regular in a lot of other countries, but nor is it universal. Um, and we think one of the key reasons um, is because it has become less useful over time um, to have those two roles combined. So as you can see in terms of funding, there has been a funding squeeze for FOI anyway. Um, if you look at the graph, you know, from 2005, um, down to 2020, the, the budget allocated to the ICO for FOI uh, regulation has gone down significantly. Um, when you compare that to uh, the Scottish Information Commissioner, obviously the ICO funding is higher because it is a larger organisation and it deals with a lot more authorities, but it's not substantially so. Um, it's worth noting that, that all it would take is an extra two million to, to get that line back up to where we were in terms of funding it in 2005. And in terms of public sector spending, two million is, is kind of a drop in the ocean. Um, so the, the budget squeeze on FOI, we, don't, we believe, you know, is, is not good for, for good quality regulation. Um, the other thing um, is that changing the status to an officer of parliament with funding allocated by parliament um, would be less politicized. You know, this has been recommended previously. Um, and again, as we say, we believe this is this is a constitutional watchdog kind of regu regulation. Um, this is not just comparable to Scotland, it's, it's happening in other places as well. Um, there are similar arrangements in Canada, and we think this is much more effective um, at keeping FOI um, properly, properly kind of overseen. Um, the other the other budget squeeze and the, the marginalisation of FOI within the ICO is becoming extreme as well. I mean, this is I think the graph says it all here. Um, obviously, because of changes in regulation on the data protection side of things, you know, the the ICO budget for data protection work has has increased significantly, um, whereas obviously, as we've seen, the FOI budget has decreased. This now represents, I think, 8% of the ICO budget now, which is, done, which is devoted to, to freedom of information. Um, we don't believe that's healthy. Um, we don't believe that, that makes for, for a good quality regulator um, to be overseeing and championing this piece of legislation. Um, the relative position, oh, sorry. Alex, can you skip it back, please? <laughs> um, yeah, the relative position is, is inappropriate at this point, we think. Um, institutionally, FOI is going to continue to be increasingly marginalised. Data protection is huge. It's not going to, to go away. Um, the use of personal data is, is going to increase. And therefore, the attention that any commissioner and any regulatory body that combines the two will pay to it will increase as well. 
um, creating a new information commissioner is a good opportunity to, to move that to, to parliamentary oversight. Um, and it will give sole oversight um, on access to information issues. Um, it'll also depoliticize it, we would hope. Um, we don't believe it's, it's healthy uh, for a regulator beholden um, to a minister to, to be regulating the government itself. Um, we've obviously, and again in the report, we go into it in, in greater detail about the arguments for or against where the ICO should sit and where responsibility should lie. Um, but we believe that it's it's far better and there will be far clearer oversight um, if it was responsible to Parliament. You know, at the moment we're recruiting a new information commissioner um, and the, the fact that the job description and the person specification barely mentioned freedom of information. Um, it was completely tailored towards getting a very kind of international data protection expert in, um, really shows how little um, FOI is considered to now be a part of that job. So we think that this will make it far, far more robust. Over to you, Alex. Thank you. So the first section of this is when we were looking at how the Scottish law works compared to the UK law, there's actually a number of areas we think that are quite good, the problems that have been sort of articulated in the UK haven't to be been solved in advance in Scotland, because it sort of worked as a because they were starting with the UK law and then revised on top of that, several practical issues have been resolved in terms of things that lead to problems now 15 years later sort of fixed at the start. So in there is much more clarity around timescales in Scotland and when a big issue with freedom of information is delays, this is it makes a big difference just in terms of how appeals work. So for instance, the internal review processes in the statute, not the code of practice, given a bit more force. Um, there is an exemption that says if, so, if the authority is going to publish something anyway, they don't have to give it to you. In Scotland, they sort of, sort of recognize that this was a, sort of a loophole and there is a time that it has to be published within three months. And the most interesting is, uh, there is a growing problem of administrative silence in responses in the UK, and this is when an authority just won't respond. And because no one responds, you can't engage the normal appeal process. In Scotland, this is sort of if there isn't a response within the statutory deadline, this is taken to be um, a, a refused, and so it can be appealed to the next level. And so th th this has gone to a bit more detail in the report. But what this means is it reduces the amount of time an authority can really drag out responses. So it is just a nice little uh, practical tweak that solves some of the problems requests have been having. But there are also philosophical differences in how Scotland works in terms of uh, slightly stronger uh, tests for like prejudice tests, which sort of require there to be an actual harm. Uh, so in Scotland, this, the language is extreme prejudice rather than just prejudice. And so that sort of makes it easier for uh, appeals against um, refusals to give information where the harm is hypothetical rather than really demonstrable. And it's a bit hard to work out exactly what the relationship between this, but generally speaking, the, uh, the, the Scottish system does result in more successful appeals through the regulator. So of appeals fully withheld in the, in the ICO, that's more than 50%. Uh, from the um, Scottish Information Commission, that's about 34%. Now there is more partially withheld, but this still in general works out in the requester's favour between the two systems. So if we're looking for examples of how to improve things in the requester's favour, look at a system nearby where there is absolutely good indications that this is already the case, is an excellent thing for reformers working inside the wider UK system to learn from. And our fourth point is, as Beck said at the start, looking a bit more about how divergence, and especially Wales, can be used to um, further access to information. And one of the things we're sort of especially concerned about in this area is uh, the private operation of public services. So both the UK and Scottish government have the ability to say that uh, private, op private bodies who do public services are subject to FOI, but the government has to explicitly say this. In the UK, this power hasn't been used much at all, whereas in Scotland, private prisons, uh, selection of private special schools and uh, social housing providers have been covered under FOI. In the UK, these equivalent things haven't been done and it often actually actively been argued against. So what we would sort of point out is for Wales, which since 2017 has had the ability to diverge on FOI, is it's, they don't necessarily have to go the full way as Scotland has and create an independent commission, special independent law, these powers to add private bodies may be incredibly relevant to them. And it would be a way of a little mini divergence 
that help makes Welsh public services more accessible to FOI without creating a large divergence in the law. So I think these kind of ways of looking at FOI in a slightly different way, that in different parts of the UK, there are different experiments going on, is a useful way of a, you know, exploring what's possible, but then after the fact, you know, in trying to learn what these, how, how we can spread those good practices around. I think Beck may be struggling to unmute here. Maybe. Sorry, my unmute button has disappeared. Um, <laughs> just quickly to sum up, I mean, we, we know FOI reform is a long game and it's really difficult to, to get any government uh, of the day to agree to, to be to more scrutiny. Um, so, I mean, this is something that we want as to be a kind of catalyst for ongoing conversation amongst civil society, amongst campaigners, amongst lobbyists. And it's something that we really want to kind of embed in our conversations over the next few years, um, coming up to when parties are starting to think about constructing their manifestos um, around the next election. You know, these are things that we think should be on the agenda for the future. Um, as much as I would love things to change tomorrow, um, we, we know that that's not going to be the case. Um, so we absolutely, you know, want to kind of create a, a kind of collaborative conversation that, that's ongoing with anyone that's interested in, in working on these issues going forward. Um, and, you know, obviously, in the meantime, um, we do run what do they know, as most of you know, uh, we're trying to maximise public access to information as much as we can. Um, so we're improving that service all the time, putting in-depth advice on there, how to craft internal reviews and appeals. Um, we've got the pro service that is very, very useful for researchers and journalists who are using FOI to craft more kind of investigative or, or academic pieces that, you know, re re require a little bit longer to, to write up before they get published. Um, and we are gathering what FOI statistics we can, um, which are available on our mini site there. So thank you very, very much um, for that. And I'm really excited to hear what other people think about the report and for Jim and Peter's thoughts. That's great. Thanks, Beck and Alex. So we'll move uh, straight on to Jim, if Jim is available. So Jim Kellett from the Open Rights Group. So it's an opportunity, Jim, to give a reflection on the report and any uh, particular questions you want to dig into from, from the chat. But I'll hand straight over to you for the, the next six, seven minutes. Thank you very much. So I, I'm really pleased to read this report. That's the first thing to say. It's um, really timely. Um, you know, obviously, uh, FOI is under a great deal of stress at the moment. Um, and, you know, it's also very clear with a government that frankly seems to have gone somewhat rogue in certain parts of these uh, matters. Uh, you know, you, you need an FOI at that point. You need the transparency. That's becoming really plain, I think. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's harder to exercise than ever, ever before for very practical reasons that, you know, open democracy and others have, have demonstrated. So I'm really, really glad to see this uh, work. On the question of the ICO and its independence, one thing I would say is I think that question applies equally to um, data protection because one of the biggest problems is actually holding the government to account for what it wants to do with personal data. And, it, you know, the, the, the ICO is, is essentially, as seems to me, to have vacated the field both on information, on, on, uh, on privacy and on freedom of information. I mean, the, the ICO should be saying the government is not doing its job. It is overstepping the mark. It is breaking the law. It's not saying these things. Um, and again, I kind of, I, I don't know if anybody from the ICO is at this meeting, but really, you know, we should be hearing their thoughts about this report as well. I think it's very clear from the report, the, 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 the uh, FOI part of the job is declining. I agree about the concerns around the recruitment process, although I'd add that the recruitment process is, 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 seems to be biased towards appointing somebody to help dismantle uh, data protection. So it doesn't really feel like, um, you know, <laughs> we're going to get any kind of ICO that's going to do its job. And that's really concerning, right? So it seems to me that independence question applies to both. On the uh, Wales and Scotland uh, points, I think, again, you know, Labour have committed to 
uh, improving FOI and extending FOI to uh, to you know the private delivery companies for the state sector. Well, it can do that already in Wales, so it shouldn't be waiting to get power at Westminster. The, the Welsh institution should pick that up because if that works in Wales, it's a way to demonstrate why it's a good idea at the UK level. And that's worked in lots and lots of other fields. It's actually working for Open Rights Group in terms of the data privacy we work we do in Scotland and, and seeing better policies on, on digital identity, more accountability for the police over what they do with biometrics and other technologies. These are things that could be replicated in the in in Wales and Scotland, and that eventually creates pressure at the UK level. Um, in terms of uh, I, the other point, I would just make quickly is is that the point about oppositions really being the parties that are going to learn and implement these changes, I think, is is critical. Um, so this is the right time to build up that head of steam and to for MPs to understand and to learn about what they need done. But it is going to be some kind of change of government, whether that's a coalition or whether that's um, the Labour Party or some other party taking over. It is unlikely to be the government of the day who, who you know, in this particular case, are very resistant to uh, freedom of information and transparency in any case, it would seem. But I think parliamentarians are going to learn those lessons and we need to make it really concrete in, in terms of uh, what is needed and what those changes look like. So, again, this report seems to be extremely uh, timely. I, I note also in the report there's a bit of talk about more work being needed to be done on exactly how the exemptions are working in practice, what kind of information gets denied and so on. Um, I, I think that would be good to see somebody pick that up as well. So all of those sort of points I think are the really key ones. Um, for Open Rights Group I think we'd be really interested in working on the devolved institutions uh, to see some some progress on informa on information rights in Wales and Scotland, partly because we have a uh, presence in Scotland already, and partly, as, as you pointed out very clearly, the, these opportunities exist today. This is something we actually can uh, get, uh, you know, make happen. So thank you very much for letting me talk. That's fantastic, Jim. Thank you. And I, I guess just in, in building on that, you know, as, as Beck mentioned already, it's both playing the long game and as much as kind of getting the ideas on the table uh, so that when opportunities to make significant changes do become available, the right ideas are there. But it's also about playing the short game as well. And you're making sure we 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 really celebrate the great uses of freedom of information and how it can uh, be so useful in kind of day-to-day -day campaigning and transparency and, you know, and how it leads to sort of better government and better decision making and continually make that case ultimately. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'll ask Peter Gagan from uh, Open Democracy, who uh, many of you will know is, is uh, really a leading light in running lots of campaigns around freedom of information. And I'll hand over uh, to Peter. Thank you very much, Mark. And thanks a million for inviting me along. You know, it's, it's great to be here with my society. You've done so much work around FY over the years. And like, what do they know pro is, you know, I would be lost without it. So a quick big up for that. It's, you know, it's been a, it's really, really great stuff. So yeah, so thanks for that. And I'd be lost at times without it. And, and I think, you know, what this report did for me is I think it's just reiterated again, just the importance of FOI in freedom of information and the whole principles of access for information. And I feel like we're in a particular moment. We've talked, lots of speakers already today have touched about, upon it, but like, you know, we have had, we've got this green lobbying scandal. We've got the prime minister today facing loads of questions about the refurbishment of his flat. The whole issue of transparency and probity in public life, I think is live in a way it probably hasn't been for a very long time, you know, and, one of the points I've been making recently is that you know we're going to have a lot more talk about lobbying laws and lobbying um, regulations soon. If we had a really functioning FOI regime, I think a lot of those questions would slip off the agenda. It's one of the arguments I've been making behind the scenes to people like Dave, you know, to Tory MPs and others, saying, "Look, this is one reason you could care about this. You can kind of sidestep these really difficult, knotty issues around." who counts as a lobbyist, who doesn't. I'm not saying don't go there, but if we had a really functioning FOI regime, a lot of those ch issues would, you know, would be a lot better than they are at the moment. Um, and I think that's a big thing. And you know, as we've got, we're, we've got a, um, a first tier tribunal case uh, with the cabinet office starting tomorrow as well around this clearinghouse as was mentioned earlier, which again, there's a lot, you know, it's around how FOI has been dealt with in, in government. And we've kind of seen this over and over, like, um, 
our recent report on uh, that Open Democracy brought out, Art of Darkness, looked at a lot of this as well and found, you know, really what you're looking at is the very departments that are supposed to be at the heart of FOI, particularly the Cabinet Office, are the worst when it comes to FOI responses, are the worst when it comes to, um, to you know, we've, anyone who's FOI the Cabinet Office, I'm sure, is familiar with this kind of endless extensions and, and a huge failure at the centre of it. So I think this report really kind of speaks to a lot of the problems we have and a lot of the big issues. And I think the idea of having the ideas to hand, I think, is a really good one. I just want to pick up a couple of themes that I think are really interesting from it. So almost, you know, that kind of speak to some of the things we've been looking at too. One is around this idea of stonewalling or what you call in the report, the Minister of Silence. You know, this is where there's a refusal is not issued at all by a public authority. It's basically ignoring the FOI response, which leaves the requester in limbo about, well, where do they go? And this has increased, the number of F uh, ICO rulings about the Minister of Silence have increased 70% since 2016. And what the problem with this is that it basically resets the clock to the start. And actually, the ICO gives the local authority or whoever it is, the public body, 35 calendar days to respond, which is more than the original 20 working days for an FOI. And I think what the report suggests about like that an FOI, if an FOI request is not answered in 20 working days, it should be considered refused. And then the requester can engage in the appeals process. And this is something that a lot of even seasoned FOI users are not aware of. I have had this conversation with so many journalists over the last six months where they would get in touch going, my FOI has not even been acknowledged. What do I do? Because um, it's something that even, you know, kind of well burst FOI users are struggling with. So I think, and we're seeing such an increase in it, you know, even just anecdotally myself, I'm seeing this more and more. I'm having to chase local authorities you know or public bodies just to say that they've received this so i think and i also think the recommendation that fy legislation has to could include an explicit time limit for internal reviews is a very good thing too because what we're also seeing is internal reviews oh, barely half of internal reviews have been done with quite within 20 days so again it's adding more and more time into this and and often it feels like it's an attempt to try and you know stop the clock and stall the release of information so i think they're very good practical ways i think they're both things that really practically um you know we could they would really help and it's interesting as well like we did recently at open box we went and did a big analysis of ico judgments and comments about um you know to various government departments and at one stage at one stage the cabinet office the ico complains to the cabinet office that there's no justifiable um, reason for it. It took eight months to conduct one internal review. And this is a huge problem because, you know, it comes on to the second point, which I thought was really interesting in the report is you know, the idea around the separation of powers, but it's the idea that we need a regulator with teeth to make this work. You know, the, there's, there's a carrot and a stick and the ICO does tend to use a hell of a lot of carrot and very little stick and just publishing, you know, just, you know, just publishing decision notices against local, against, um, public bodies isn't enough it's not sufficient there needs to be action the ico has shown itself very 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 unwilling for action and we've you know people have talked about this already today and you can't look into the report i think that some nice use of graphics seeing those kind of change in the ico's budget and this focus such a heavy focus now on data protection i think is really striking you know it's it's in the, the last annual report, there's just half a page about ICO, about the FIO, FOI in the ICO's annual report. So that gives you an indication of just how much, you know, kind of focus there is internally. And I think this idea, you know, I think the comment that's made in the reporting, the phrase is used that the, that the ICO's data protection and FOI portfolios are on divergent paths, which I think is a polite way of saying there's a lot of focus on one aspect and not a lot of focus on the other. So I think... You know, I, I do feel as if the, that is something that really does require attention, whether it's a separation of powers, you know, I think there's a can be discussion around it, but I think there has to fundamentally be a regulator that works that's focused on this issue. And I think we're not seeing that. And we're not seeing that from public statements from the ICO either. I think under Elizabeth Denham is quite clearly saw itself as a data protection regulator. I don't even think first and foremost, I think almost solely. So I think even just starting that conversation, getting people aware of it, I think it's really important because if we're going to see a culture change in FOI, which I think is what probably is the biggest problem is the cultural aspect of this, you know, and the report does talk about changes in legislation, but I think, you know, most people would feel like, you know, actually there's a lot good that we have in terms of legislation. The problem is how that legislation is enacted. And if we're going to see a culture change, it has to come from a regulator, you know, and I think that's the thing where I think, politicians other people who could be advocates for what for change need to kind of understand too and just finally um on the idea of expansion of foi i think you know the idea of bringing out foi to include things like socially registered landlords housing associations 
the whole gamut of public sector work that's done by private companies. I think we can all agree on this. The ICO agrees on it. The Labour Party. We've been talking about this a lot. You know, in the wake of the kind of contracting stuff, I think this is all really important. Um, and, you know, we kind of, we're, but unfortunately, we're in a different place where the government is actually intentionally not um, included this new advanced research and invention agency, what's called ARIA, in FOI. So we're kind of seeing, rather than the expansion of FOI, in some respects, the retraction. And just to lend with like a kind of word of warning to even about the idea of expansion is that I guess I'm always a bit worried when it comes to this current administration, when it comes to asking for things like um, legislation to be opened up for examination, that that could be used as an opportunity to kind of close down things. So I think being strategic about what we want to see change legislatively is very important. And my sense is that there's actually a lot of things that exist that if they just were working properly and working well, um, we could really, you know, things would be a huge, uh, a huge improvement. So I think that's the one thing as well and in terms of thinking about how we move forward with some of this stuff but over i just thought it was a really interesting report i thought it brought a lot out and i think there's lots for all of us in the community to consider that's great thank you so much peter and you know, echo that very much i mean you are the, the 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 legislation is there and just 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 putting the emphasis on actually making sure it's enacted in the right way and people are able to kind of make use of the rights they already have is a a really critical component of 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 the next you know, few months and years, and that's certainly an area that my society's uh, continued to committed to through the expansion to the work we're doing with what do they know and what do they know pro. Um, certainly, making it easier to understand why rejections happen, you know what what sort of uh, responses might be appropriate in certain circumstances, and really kind of helping oil the wheels of the FOI process to make it you know better for requesters, but also easier for public bodies to respond to as well. Um, so thanks again, Jim and Peter. Thank you so much, uh, Beck and Alex, for a great introduction of the report. Uh, I hope you've had a chance to read a copy of the report yourself. Again, it is available on uh, uh, research.mysociety.org. Gem has posted it there in the chat as well. I know there were a lot of questions in the chat and we will be following up and, and there'll be a blog uh, our blogs about uh, the, the some of the topics we've covered. Uh, also, we recorded this session, so there'll be a, we'll be sharing a copy of this recording as well. And this will be the first of many uh, interventions. I'm sure we would like to make uh, both as my society, but but you're supporting the great work that happens within the broader FOI community, which is really represented here today. And just one last thing, just a, a quick shout out to Martin Rosenbaum, who I uh, noticed on Twitter is. Uh, Moving on from the BBC, he's been a tireless user and, and advocate of FOI in his work. So uh, best of luck to, to him in future endeavours as well. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we're a little bit over time, but I think that was well worth it. Really good conversation or presentations and look forward to seeing you all soon.